Hey, this is Tanner Sherlock. I'm the pastor at Shadow State Chi Alpha. And this is our podcast where our mission is to make disciples who then make disciples. Be sure and subscribe so you can get our content every time we post. And I pray that this message blesses you today. God bless. Did you know that there is an actual art form as to how to start a speech or a sermon? Um, it's something that pastors study, but um, it's something that gets put out. Actually, TED Talks have kind of popularized and shown that if you're to start out a speech or a sermon with a mic check or saying, hi, my name is Pastor Tanner. Um, I'm the missionary to Shatteron State in Nebraska. Um, by doing that, you immediately cause your audience to check out. They instantly, boom, check out. If you start with a 30 second pause, don't say anything for 30 seconds. That is better than starting out a speech or a sermon with a mic check. It's kind of crazy thinking about that. Sometimes even the uncomfortability of silence will draw in people's popu- uh, draw in people's um, attention more than introducing yourself or saying, "Here, this is my family. Here, introduce myself." Blah blah blah. Robotic. We're so conditioned to that that our brain immediately checks out. People aren't going to remember who you are if you introduce yourself right off the bat. That's unfortunate, but it's true. Um, Psychologically, they've studied it through speech. They've studied it immediately. People are more likely, especially now in today's world of telephones, people are more likely to pull out their phone, going to check and make sure that it's turned off and silence it and do all of that. That is more likely to happen if you introduce yourself or you start with a mic check or something like that. Now you can start off with a stat, a pause, a, you know, anything other than that. And your retention rate is going to be significantly higher. And so, um, psychology of sermons and the psychology of speeches and the psychology of being a pastor, it's one of my biggest interests. Um, I studied a psychology in my undergrad and the human brain just, um, it, it's so interesting to me and the way that we think and the way that we act and, and how our conditioning, you know, growing up and how we were raised can affect the way that we see things and hear things. And as a pastor, I think it's extremely important for me to learn this stuff so that I can present the gospel in a way that's effective for both the people who grew up in a privileged home and the people who grew up in poverty, the people who grew up with a lot and the people who grew up with a little, the people who grew up in a calm, awesome, um, excellent parent to parent home, the people who grew up in a, a single parent or abusive or whatever. How do you present the gospel to both of those? How do you present the gospel to an 80 year old saint who's been a Christian since she was three seconds old? And at the same time, the 20 year old who just walked through the doors, who just figured, you know what, I'm going to give God one chance. And if he doesn't show up, I'm going to take my life. How do you present the gospel? How do you share about God in a way that is captivating to both of those people? That's the job of a pastor, a good pastor, at least the job of someone who is going to try to speak to their entire audience and not just a select portion of it. And so me as a missionary, as a pastor, and as somebody who's studied psychology, one of the biggest ways that we can do that, and honestly, that goes back to even how we start out our speeches, one of the biggest ways we can do that is by getting people uncomfortable. Uncomfortability helps us to grow. And that's crazy to think about because we think of, well, no, comfortable. I I need to be comfortable in my faith. I need to be comfortable with something before I do it. But in reality, that's the exact opposite way that we approach anything and everything else. Um, If you think about uh, athletics, so a professional athlete, he's not going to go in and just do things that are comfortable for him while he's weight training. He's not going to do things that are comfortable for him while he's um, sprint training, uh, learning plays, doing all that stuff. If he just stays in comfortable he's not going to make the team. If a boxer stays in the comfortable while he's training his next fight, he's going to get knocked out. If an MMA fighter just stays in the comfortable, 
they're going to get tapped. They're going to get knocked out. They're going to possibly, <laughs> you know, end up in a coma if they try to jump into a ring without actually getting themselves uncomfortable with their training. They're learning new things. They're um, getting the, the, the muscles fatigued so that it's uncomfortable. So they have to rebuild the whole process of weight training is breaking things down so that they rebuild. It's uncomfortable. And that's where the gospel is. That's where we find ourselves when we learn about Jesus is Jesus thrived in the uncomfortable. Pretty much the entire gospel of Jesus are stories of him making the disciples and making those around him uncomfortable. He wasn't here to just say, yeah, I'm going to do exactly what you want me to do. I'm going to be a king. I'm going to take over the earth and I'm going to rule um, with an iron fist. And people are going to know that God is real because I am a king. Because that's what the people wanted him to do. They wanted him to be a ruler, an earthly ruler. But his entire existence infuriated the Jews who thought that that's what they wanted or what they, or that's what they wanted. He infuriated them. He made them so mad. But it's ironic then that in the American church, we have become infatuated. We've become so infatuated with comfort that our churches become more about programs than they become about people. They become more about how we appear than the actual gospel. We got to make sure that the lighting is correct. We got to make sure that the sound is correct. We got to make sure that this and that and this and that is perfect. But in reality, you can have the perfect musicians on stage and they're not going to usher in the Holy Spirit. But you get someone who's willing to make mistakes, but loves Jesus with his whole heart and searches after the Holy Spirit. That's the worship I want to be under. That's the worship I want to be in. I don't want to be in worship that there's that is just obsessed with perfection. Now, on the opposite side, you can become so obsessed with imperfection and the fact that like you're you're not concerned about being good. You're just concerned about you know oh am I going to usher in the Holy Spirit's presence and neglect your ability to play and show up and just think that you can play the guitar. Like there's got to be a give and take with it. We still, one of the, the greatest quotes that I, I've, I've ever heard, and it's not biblical, but it's just an earthly quote, is you should pray like God is the only person who can do it, but work as though it depends upon yourself. And then the point of the, the quote is we need to make sure that we're doing our part of the equation, but also recognize and pray and see and know that God has to do his part. We trust in God and we believe in God and we have faith in God, but we also need to act and we also need to do. Um, our churches, in order for our churches to grow, they need people who both understand God is calling them to get uncomfortable in their faith as well as understand that God's totally in control. When Jesus was talking to the disciples and training the disciples, there was, I mean, there was times where literally a hundred disciples left. There used to be more than 12, there was more than 12 disciples. And he was talking about um, eating his flesh and drinking his blood in order to um, inherit the kingdom and be born again. And the disciples were like, this is a hard teaching. Uh, we're out. And he turned to the other 12 and he's like, aren't you guys going to leave too? And they were like, where would we go? They were willing to be uncomfortable because they trusted Jesus. The others didn't trust Jesus. And so we have to trust Jesus and be willing to be uncomfortable in our faith. But again, we become so infatuated with our own feelings that if we don't feel Jesus in the room, quote, quote unquote, that that means that the worship wasn't anointed or that the pastor wasn't feeling it or that, you know, maybe the musicians screwed up a few notes or they messed up some lyrics or maybe the, the, the dude in the soundboard, you know, tweaked something and there was a twang and forgot to change the lyrics because he was trying to fix the soundboard. And we, we get so obsessed with it that it immediately takes our mind off of Christ. But Matthew 28 says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. 
When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Uh, that verse, that scripture, not that verse, um, we know that as the Great Commission. It's one of the most quoted pieces of scripture in Christianity. We talk about it all the time, about how this is our call to go and make disciples. But the, uh, the Great Commission ends with, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is regarded to be one of the greatest promises in the Bible. But I also, I don't see this as a promise. I actually see this as a statement. Jesus is saying, I am with you always. He's not saying I promise to be with you or I promise that I'll come back or I promise that. No, he's saying I am with you always, which is very different than what Satan says when Satan is tempting Jesus, because Satan says to Jesus, if you will bow down to me, if you bow down to me, all of this can be yours. Whereas Jesus is different than that. He's saying, no, I love you and I am with you. This is important because as it ends the Great Commission, there's something significant about it. So what does it mean? How does it apply to the Great Commission? Well, how does it how does it weave into this? I want to take a step back and go back to what we were talking about before. In America, specifically, maybe other countries as well, our feelings have become our God. For example, this morning I woke up a little bit grumpy because um, we brought our son into to bed with us in the morning and he's smacking me in the face. I was a little grumpy. I was upset. That feeling was temporary because in the reality of things, oh, I love being woken up by my son. Smack or cuddle. I love the fact that I get to be woken up by my son, that I'm even woken up in the first place, let alone by my son, who is a miracle that he's even here. I'm so excited about those things. But for a temporary short little time this morning, I was a little grumpy because I was tired. So why do I get so salty? Like, don't get me started on when, you know, our spouse gets hangry. You know, when you're angry and hungry at the same time and it, they combine and you just, they lose track of their feelings and emotion. Guys, and I know you guys know what I'm talking about, but I get it. All I have to do is mention tacos, and now all of a sudden you feel like this sermon, this this podcast might be lasting a little too long. I just mentioned some some uh, you know street tacos with some cilantro on top, and all of a sudden your brain's going somewhere else, and you're realizing you haven't eaten yet. I mentioned a beefy burrito with just gobs of nacho cheese and and tomatoes, and just like that perfect blend of taco meat mixed with cheese sauce wrapped into a crispy tortilla and all of a sudden boom you don't even remember what i was talking about anymore you're just thinking about food our feelings the feeling of being hungry changes our perception of things if we're hungry we're less likely to be interested in a sermon on a sunday morning but that's the thing about jesus is that his love for us doesn't fly out the window every time that we that, that he feels something He's not all of a sudden, oh, I feel like, I feel like this guy, I don't, I don't like him anymore. We're going to just smite him real quick. But after that, oh yeah, yeah, I love humankind. Like his feelings don't change. So because of that, this statement that Jesus makes that he is with us always, even to the end of the age, the Holy Spirit is with us always. The God of the universe is with us always to the end of the age. It's a statement. <clears throat> now, perhaps you woke up this morning and it could be today, it could be this week, this month, this year. Maybe it's been a few years and you might be sitting there saying, I don't, 
I haven't felt God's presence in a really long time. I don't feel God around me. It's been a long time. I've been there. And maybe more often than you would think would be fitting for a pastor, but we do have to move past the feeling of God being with us into a knowing God is with us. And then we then have to stand in that firm foundation that Christ is with us. There is no uncertainty. We have given our life to Christ. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is with us. He is faithful and he is with you. Because there might come a day where you find yourself in a wilderness season going through the refining fire as First Peter 6 talks about and says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, will perish even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. A refining season is oftentimes a season in which it seems like everything is going wrong and Jesus is so far away and it feels like God just flat out isn't listening. Like if you've ever prayed for more patience, you know exactly what I'm talking about because God doesn't just instantly make you more patient. He gives you the tools that it takes in order to be more patient. And sometimes that comes with situations that call for you to be patient or situations that are going to stress you out to the max. We learn patience. We don't get patience. You know, it's the embodiment of the footprints poem. You know what I'm talking about? When, why, at my hardest of times in life, is there only one set of footprints? It's because the sand people walk single file to hide their numbers. Oh, wait, that's Star Wars. Never mind. Um, clicked into the wrong notes. My bad. Um, now, that doesn't mean that all hardship is a test sent by God. However, God will use all of our experiences and our hardships to grow us closer to him if we let him, if we keep him number one in our lives. And Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Paul wrote that from prison. He was thrown in prison for preaching the gospel. The very gospel that he is saying gives us the, the rejoicing. That very gospel is why he landed in prison and he's still saying it's worth it to a people that are free. To the church in Philippi, who they weren't in jail. And he's telling them, hey, you, you guys need to remember to rejoice. And if he has to remind us to rejoice, that usually means some circumstances exist that are calling for us to not be rejoiceful. And I have joy. The fact that we have to be reminded of it tells us that there's going to be seasons where we don't have joy. But sometimes we get that attitude that I've been doing good. I've been reading my Bible. I've been praying. I've been doing everything right. And God is still distant. Yeah. Sometimes that's how it happens. But God isn't actually distant. You might feel distant. But Jesus promised us. He, he gave a statement. He is with us. And we have to trust in him in that. We have to go to that place of understanding and not in a place of feeling. Now, this is where this podcast gets a little bit uncomfortable. So this statement that comes right after the Great Commission, and you think about it, the Great Commission is our calling to go and spread the gospel, which means that God is commissioning us to go and make disciples. He's commissioning us to share our faith. He is commissioning us to spread his message. He's commissioning us to love our neighbor, love God, go and make disciples. So that means it is your job to share the gospel at your workplace. It is your job to, to share the gospel when you go to the DMV, to the grocery store, when you go buy a vehicle, when you, whatever you're doing in all things to your neighbor. Wondering why maybe you haven't got a call on God to go overseas. You don't know where you're supposed to go, but while you've been here in America where you're free to share the gospel, you haven't even approached your neighbors with it. It's your job to evangelize. It's your job to share the gospel. It's your job to make disciples out of your neighbors, those around you. But when I say that, it's easy for you to go, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. God isn't really calling me to reach the lost or I'm not 
I'm not really equipped um, for that, or I don't feel like that's what God wants me to do. But Jesus tells us, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age, immediately after telling us that we need to go make disciples. That tells me that we are equipped. You are equipped because Jesus is with you, because the Holy Spirit is with you, and all you have to do is allow your faith to multiply. So for me, what it looks like is, hey, you like tacos? Let's go grab some tacos. I got I got some tacos going tonight. I got some barbacoa meat cooking in a crock pot, and I got all the fixing. Like it's gonna be good. You should join us for dinner. Don't worry about bringing anything. You, I got drinks too. Don't worry. Don't, you don't have to pick anything up. No, you're, you're good. Just come on over, eat some food. Let's talk. Or hey, do you like disc golf? Oh, you never played before? I, I could teach you. Oh, you, you've played a lot. Yeah, yeah, dude. I love playing. Let we should we should get a couple rounds in this week. I'm not even kidding. I've made more disciples over disc golf and tacos than anything else. Because people need to eat. They're going to eat dinner no matter what. People like free food. So why not be the one who provides them the free food and get to know them and love them and show them Christ and eventually make disciples. Share with my faith with them eventually. We overcomplicate it. That's the problem. We make it so complicated. We give ourselves anxiety about it, and then we don't do anything about it. But here's the thing. In your neighborhood, just in your neighborhood alone, I'd venture to say there's thousands of people who live near you. Within a three-mile radius of you, there's thousands of people. And I would bet that those thousands of people would never step foot in a church but they would more than willing step foot in your house for some free food. And what we do is we go out and we love people and we share the gospel and we make disciples in confidence. We love our community in confidence because Jesus is with us. So I just want to challenge you today. Go. Make disciples. Go make disciples in confidence. Because, again, Matthew 28 says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's powerful. So I give you the same command. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Christ. Therefore, you, listener to this podcast, go and make disciples of your neighborhood. That's where you've been sent. That's where you are. Your job. That's where you're at. Go make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded you. And surely he is with you. Always. Lord, I thank you for these people who are listening to podcasts. I pray that you would empower them, give them the confidence, and help them to know and walk in knowing that you have equipped them, that you have called them to make disciples. Lord, I pray that you would be with them, and that they could walk in a knowing that you are with them. It's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen.